pónganse duro que ahora sí que vamos a gozar. Okay, so I'm on my third uh, book two prize, which is How the Word is Passed by Clint Smith. And I'm, I hate the Supreme Court so much. Uh, it's a powerful book. I'm on the verge of crying. Uh, yeah, it's doing a fantastic job of... Uh, a reckoning with the history of slavery across America, it's called. Uh, I already finished uh, the nonfiction book on Dr. Cream. We'll talk about that maybe a little later. And then I finished uh, American Baby, which was very interesting. Uh, also cried in that one. But uh, just had to take a break because uh, some of these Supreme Court rulings boggle my mind, take my breath away. Uh, I find so, so very unjust. Uh, powerful book, How the Word is Passed by Clint Smith. What? What? In uh, How the Word is Passed, I'm reading about uh, the celebration of Juneteenth, right? And a young lady has just read a proclamation saying that long before enslaved Africans arrived, the Spanish enslaved some of the native populations against the wishes of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand Fernando against their wishes? First time I've ever heard of that. Oh, I'm, I smell a rabbit hole coming. <laughs> I smell a rabbit hole coming. So I get excited when a book, I can make associations and uh, connections to, to our experience in Puerto Rico when my brain just starts uh, snapping. And uh, this is what is happening with how the word is passed. Uh, many connections to colonialism. Yeah, because of these oppressive hierarchies, you know, have a lot of things in common. Uh, so according to uh, the Kindle, I'm on page 179, and he's commenting on uh, how impressed he is with the students uh, of this freedom school that has to do with the Children's Defense uh, Fund. Uh, they had a program for six weeks in uh, summer and learned many, many historical facts that impressed him. Yeah, and he's reflecting on how he would have liked to have uh, that experience and learned those things when he was young and how you know generations of people have been brought up believing myths and that's what's happened here in Puerto Rico yeah, yeah. this is not the place to talk about it but uh, I can just you know identify with everything that he's saying in those terms and even remembered uh, a book that I had just recently read about uh, the breaking of our collective memory, right? And believing myths, and then having to, you know, have those myths challenged. Yeah, what that, what that does to uh, a collective, to a group of people. American Baby took me by surprise uh, because I was expecting a straight nonfiction narrative of the history of adoption in the United States. That's not the way it went, no. Uh, this was, this was 
for the most part, the story of a specific family that was broken up by adop adoption. Uh, a pair of, you know, teenage lovers uh, of Jewish extraction in, the, in New York City. And her mother, when they find out that she's pregnant, sends her off to this maternity home in Staten Island. And the maternity home which was part, uh, became part of a large chain of, of adoption around the United States. Uh, how they badgered this uh, teenage mother. She wanted to keep the baby, but at a certain point, they kept badgering and badgering her until they threatened her with juvie home if she didn't put the child up for adoption. So that's what she did. But for decades and decades, she never forgot her baby. And, and the thing is that she married her high school sweetheart. And they went on to have four more children. You know. And then it follows the story of the adopted child, right? David. We, we start off, uh, the introduction uh, starts off talking about David already as a middle-aged man who's confronting uh, his uh, condition with cancer. And so we're going through the whole, you know, chronological order of uh, his life with his new family and at the same time his mom, who has never forgotten him, and the attempts that she made not only to find him, which was, you know, hard because of the closed archives. But to make sure that the agency knew about the father's, her, her, her child's father's medical conditions, because there was a possibility that he would, and turns out, you know. So anyway, um, yeah, it was very interesting. and. I was surprised at myself because <laughs> I, you know, I got caught up in the pathos of the story. So yeah, got to cry there. So up to now, this is going to be a very um, contested <laughs> ranking between these three because, yeah. They're all good. Until next time, bye. So I'm almost finished with how the word is passed. I've already cried three times. It's so moving. Um, we're following Clint Smith as he visits different places, both in the United States and in Senegal. Uh, and his, um, his visits and conversations and interviews with different people are very, very powerful and uh, reflective, very, uh, very good questions that he asks of the different people that he speaks to. Uh, at the Whitney Museum, for example, and then in uh, the tour uh, of slavery in New York City, that he took, and then also at the Statue of Liberty, uh, of course, in Senegal, and uh, interviews with all sorts of people, uh, administrators of museums as well as students in Senegal. But he has such a lyrical way of writing that, and paints these images so precisely and so exquisitely uh, that I've been moved to tears uh, several times. So that's all I wanted to say for now. Uh, I should be finished tonight with uh, Clint Smith and then have plenty of time uh, to finish the next three books in the book, Duke Prize. So. 
Now I'm reading A Little Devil in America by Hanif Abdurraqib. Uh, the subtitle, the sub, let, let me look at my uh, Kindle, because I have it on the Kindle. Uh, and I'm doing a hybrid reading. A Little Devil in America notes in praise of black performance. Notes in praise of black performance. And I just had to uh, stop because I'm so delighted <laughs> with how it begins. Not at first, though, because uh, it starts off uh, a little very differently <laughs> from what I expect a, of a nonfiction book. Right, it starts off uh, with an introduction that sounds very much like uh, poetry, poetry, and uh, describing a scene from when he was very young and would watch MTV, uh, like squirreled away in uh, in his room by himself in you know, while everybody else was asleep and dancing by himself and finishes with the observation that there was no more cable after his mom died. It's very sad. But then he goes on uh, to talk about dance marathons in the United States. And... Uh, how the dance marathons began in the 20s and you know had to do with uh, with the obsession at that time in the United States with numbers and with performance and uh, with how long you could endure right and how he googled black dance marathons <laughs> and you know he had the little line that you know has to have but doesn't right uh, and so he's contrasting the difference between black dancing dancing among in, in the black community in the United States and these dance marathons which later during the Depression became uh, sources of food, right? Because some promoters would offer food or shelter during the Depression. Yeah, very, it's just wonderful description, descriptive language that he uses. Then, um, and he starts talking about Soul Train and how Soul Train, you know, was transmitted through WGN in Chicago. And I remember Soul Train. And he describes, you know, coming home and watching Soul Train on TV, which was what I did, right? Uh, of course, in a whole earlier generation than he mentions in this book. Right, uh, yeah, I was there when Soul Train <laughs> began, so yeah, and I am thoroughly delighted. I didn't think I was going to enjoy this one, but I'm enjoying it so far. This is going to be difficult to rank all of these books because each of them has been just great in its own way. Until later. So I had to take a substantial break from reading A Little Devil in America by Hanif uh, Durakib uh, because it touched me so much. I was bawling uh, during the section which has to do with death as performance. Uh, it touched me so very deeply. I don't know if it's uh, because of you know the state of the world right now. Uh, the colony's vulnerability, 
uh, the losses collectively as well as personally. It touched me so very, very much. Doesn't help either that uh, he's talking about Soul Train, which I used to watch as a teenager. And um, Don Cornelius was uh, such a presence in all of our lives uh, as adolescents and teens. Uh, finding out uh, how he died and then he goes into uh, how how funerals are celebrated, the difference between funerals in the Muslim community and then in uh, the African American community. And then he uh, speaks to the death of Michael Jackson, uh, to his fans, and uh, the death of Aretha Franklin and her funeral. Uh, and as much as I wanted to chuckle at uh, his occurrences, uh, his phrasing, his uh, beautiful, beautiful prose, you can tell he's a poet, uh, it just moved me so very, very much because these were, you know, cultural icons, uh, you know, especially Aretha and Don Cornelius from when I was very, very young. So yeah, touched me very deeply. I might be prejudiced. <laughs> I don't know. It's gonna be tough, this ranking. Bye. So I almost cried again, uh, meeting a little devil in America. Just so moving. He is now describing uh, the documentary Amazing Grace, which was released after Aretha Franklin's passing, and tells the story behind the documentary and how she fought for it not to be released unless, you know, she was adequately compensated. So once the family saw it after she passed and gave the go-ahead, the documentary was released in 2019, and uh, the author goes to uh, see the documentary at a theater, at a movie theater. And his beautiful, beautiful description of that performance of Amazing Grace, which was a best-selling LP. <laughs> I've heard it many, many, many times. Uh, so again, uh, this book is, is uh, speaking to my own experience, right? To, to music that I've heard and that I've loved. Okay, so it's just beautiful, beautiful description of his experience watching that documentary uh, with the other people in the theater. And it's just beautiful language. It was very stirring. So now, uh, apparently, before, between each part, right, between the, the primary essays, there's like, um, I don't know if you call it a poem or a, a string of consciousness, you know, piece, or th it's, it's, like a, I, I, I tend to call it a poem. It's the part in which he uses and, 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 or the ampersand, right? And in this part, that was a very moving, very moving uh, little piece there about uh, having a white roommate and what happened, you know, with the experience that he had with uh, that roommate. Then he starts off, I haven't read not even the entire first sentence of uh, this part. This one goes out to all the magical Negroes. That's what this section is called. This one goes out to all the magical Negroes. And it starts off, to Uncle Remus in Song of the South the magical Negro, from whom all of the magical Negroes stem. 
hit me again because that LP, which is no longer available, right, because racism, we had it at home when I was a little girl, little girl. And they had, uh, that was the soundtrack for the movie Song of the South, which was uh, part anime, animation, right? Uh, Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Bear and Br'er Fox uh, and part movie in which Uncle Remus is the magical Negro, right? Like Uncle Tom. And the music from that LP is just, you know, indelibly recorded in my brain from when I was a child. I'm not going to sing it now, but <laughs> I remember it. And I remember the song that the enslaved people sang in that movie, right? Uh, song of the South. Yeah, in which the the message of the lost cause is you know is displayed in in the lyrics of that song. Yeah, I'm gonna stay right here in the home I love. Okay, that's all. This is <laughs> this is going up <laughs> in the rankings <laughs> with every. Uh, section that I and I'm only in uh, on page 49 <laughs> Bye. okay so um, due to unforeseen uh, circumstances and uh, things that have happened I took a one-day break I think it was and but I've been taking notes uh, the honeymoon is over <laughs> Maybe you'll be glad to hear. Uh, but I still admire this author tremendously. Uh, his notes on, what is it called? Notes on black performance. Notes in praise of black performance uh, continue with uh, little nuggets, just gems of information having to do with black performers and black performances in the overall, you know, uh, racist uh, United States. Um, for example, after, after Aretha Franklin and after the Magical Negro, right, uh, he continues with uh, blackface, talking about blackface and uh, 16 ways of uh, blackface, looking at blackface. And talks about Dickens, Charles Dickens' uh, experience of watching uh, a dancer in blackface, right? happens to be a black dancer by the name of William Henry Lane, who was called Juba, who was black, but had to put on blackface over his blackface. Yeah, little nuggets of information like that, that I, you know, that I never knew. And, you know, just surprised me all the time. Uh, he talks about John Diamond, who was a white Irish dancer who would put on blackface. Um, and how John Diamond, the white Irish dancer in the blackface, would have competitions. These were ongoing competitions with William Henry Lane, Juba, the, the real black dancer who also had blackface, and how William Henry Lane would always win, right? Um, 
Yeah, little, little nuggets like that. Al Jolson, he talks about a little bit about Al Jos Jolson and how uh, allegedly Al Jolson really loved black people. Uh, talks about, and then, I'm not going to quote him, but in these, you know, nuggets of information, gems of information, uh, he will make observations that are right on point, right, that go right to the heart of the issues that he, pre that he presents. One of the 16 uh, ways of looking at blackface is the Ben Vereen's performance at Ronald Reagan's inaugural ball gala in which Ben Vereen is paying homage to a black vaudevillian called Burt Williams. Tremendous story. Never heard of it before in my life. That is going to be a rabbit hole, right? Talks about later on, in the next section is called On the Certain and Uncertain Movement of Limbs. And I was wondering why he talks about Whitney Houston in this movement of limbs. And he is describing... Now I remember, he's describing Whitney Houston's awkwardness at the 1988 Grammys and how she really couldn't dance, you know, with ease uh, in that performance. How later on, at the Soul Train Music Awards, she was booed by the black uh, audience. And he goes into why uh, she was booed. And later on, how she received, uh, when was that? I don't know what year it was. She received, in 1994, she received the Sammy Davis Jr. Award uh, and how she talks about Sammy Davis Jr. to her audience and links it, his experience, to her own experience as a black entertainer who was being marketed for the white audience. Same as Sammy Davis Jr. Just, you know, just little tidbits of, of things that, you know, I had never heard of. Um, he goes on to talk about uh, Bill Bailey, the dancer, uh, LaBelle, the group LaBelle from which Patti LaBelle comes from, and Marmalade. Talks about Billy D. Williams, mentions Trayvon Martin, right? And uh, the performer Sandra. Talks about Josephine Baker during World War II, before and after that. His section on spades, I know nothing about the game of spades, which is a card game, right, in, that's played in the black community. Know nothing about it, but the idea was very, very well presented. It was an essay of love for his friends, friendship. I'm going to stop here because the lamp is going crazy. Bye. Now, continuing. Uh, his section on Don Shirley, the real Don Shirley, the concert pianist who uh, left a career in uh, classical music to become a psychologist. Fascinating. That was a fascinating story. And then he links that to uh, the propensity of 
Hollywood films uh, to try to uh, sell the idea of uh, resolving racism facilely. Oh, it was brilliant. I thought it was brilliant. Brilliant presentation of that uh, theme. Uh, it's fantastic. And then uh, the Green Book, he talks about the real Green Book and uh, what it really means in terms of uh, user, what he has a term for it, user supplied right, uh, data, information gleaned from the black community for the black community's safety while traveling, right? and how he got his hands on a 1952 edition of the Green Book to be able to travel, and how reassuring it is to find uh, black people on a car trip, on a road trip, that will steer you clear of, um, of danger, right? And how the movie the Green Book had nothing to do with the Green Book. Fantastic analysis, brilliant analysis of that movie, uh, The Green Book. If you haven't seen it, uh, watch it. Yeah. And then comes, you know, the end of the honeymoon, uh, even though it, it led me down a real rabbit hole. I, I, I went into this. I haven't gone down the previous rabbit holes yet, but this rabbit hole had to do with background sing backup singer uh, Mary Clayton, who is the female voice that we hear in the Rolling Stones' Give Me Shelter, the one who screams, who sings loudly, uh, rape and murder, right? And he present he, he such a fascinating, fascinating account of her life as a backup singer. And it gives the impression to me, right, it gave me the, a, a very uh, sad, dark impression of her life, a uh, tragic life as a backup singer, uh, performer. And it's sort of like uh, a wish by the author that she had had a solo career, the solo career that she deserved, right? And, uh, you know, it's the one tragedy after another. Um, so I went down that rabbit hole. I looked up the song, of course, Gimme Shelter, because frankly, I was not a Rolling Stones fan. I was an R&B soul music fan. Uh, and I didn't, you know, I had heard Give Me Shelter, but it wasn't, you know, in my mind. So I looked it up and I went down that rabbit hole. I, I continued watching videos uh, and homages to Mary Clayton, right? And uh, that sad impression that he gives of her life is not the impression that I got at all. Even after her tragic accident, I might be, ex I might be mistaken, right? Her, her life might really be tragic uh, away from the cameras and uh, from the videos on, on YouTube that I found. But that's not the impression that I got, right? Um, so, you know, there, there was a little uh, pushback on my part as far as his, his conception of her life and her career, right? So that's how the honeymoon ended <laughs> between Hanif and I. <laughs>